Um, and, uh, and we're going to talk tonight about five practices, five, five practices with nuances that make those practices more, that have made those practices more effective for me. So I don't know about all of you, but I know when I come to one of these things, I'm, I'm hoping to take away, if I can take away one thing that I can use the next day, that's really useful. And what I'm hoping to give you is five things, one for, one for each of these, um, uh, whether it's a, uh, a nuance or a technique or a, um, uh, or a metaphor that can help you bring more people into actually being agile instead of doing agile. So uh, thanks Volker for the introduction. I'll, uh, I will do a little bit of, of introducing of myself. So I started in tech as a programmer and, um, and uh, I then became a manager and a director and a VP of engineering and occasionally a VP of products. Uh, 22 years ago, uh, I encountered Agile for the first time uh, in the form of extreme programming. Um, I encountered Scrum for the first time 19 years ago and I took my first Scrum trainings from Chris Sims who if he was not a Bay ALN founder, he for sure was one of its earliest members. Um, and uh, and I took a couple of subsequent trainings from Chris. I also took trainings from a couple of, of not local people, but also, but uh, uh, maybe, maybe more internationally well-known than Chris, although he's pretty well-known, from uh, Tobias Mayer and from Mike Cohn. Um, and I have to tell you that uh, Chris Sims is still my favorite trainer and, and the trainer uh, whom I try to emulate when I train teams in Agile. Uh, because 12 years ago, I began training teams uh, in Agile, primarily in Scrum, but also in Kanban and, in, and somewhat in extreme programming. Nine years ago, I pivoted my career to consulting. Uh, to I, I coach engineering and business and product leaders on how to build and improve their teams. I sometimes step in as an interim VP of engineering and then I interweave um, uh, uh, trainings for teams and executives in making their process more effectively agile uh, into that uh, consulting practice. 16 years ago, my co-author Mickey Mantle and I began crafting a book on managing software people and teams. Uh, one of the very few books on managing software people and teams, it turns out that when at the point at which our book came out, uh, nine years ago, we believed it was the seventh or eighth in the history of programming on managing software people and teams. So all of you know, there's a ton of books on project management. There are a ton of books. There are hundreds of books on Agile alone, and yet there are almost none on managing and leading the, the people who actually deliver those projects. And so that's what we set out to do. Um, and to share, uh, and it started out, um, one, of the, one of the ways that it started out for Mickey and me was that we realized that we wanted to share uh, uh, some rules of thumb and nuggets of wisdom that we'd been sharing with each other and that we found really valuable for us. And we thought it would be really helpful to share them with a larger group of people. 100 rules of thumb and nuggets of wisdom embedded in, our, in the center section of our book. Uh, and then a year ago, after um, four printings and our book was translated into four languages, our publisher, Addison Wesley, asked us to bring out a second edition. And I'm bringing that up specifically because not only did we update it throughout, but we added an entirely new chapter specifically addressing the role of managers in Agile. I'm also the co-author of the study of product team performance. Um, now, the study of product team performance, we've had, I think we've had six of them so far. And, um, and so we, we query people on product teams all over the world. We've just finished doing that uh, for a pandemic edition for last year. Um, we, we ask people all over the world to characterize their teams. So we, we ask people who are product managers and project managers and program managers and scrum masters and, and developers and testers and uh, business analysts and writers people who are on product teams to characterize their team. Is it a high performance or is it low performance or is it something in between? And then we ask them about practices and we look at what correlates to the highest performance teams. And so I'm gonna share some of those results with you. Some of which are, are going to validate what you already know and some of which you may find surprising because I did. 
Um, so what I want to share with you today are the five practices that um, five practices that we all know are important. Uh, I'm going to contend that they're critical, uh, and yet the nuances too frequently escape too many of us. And uh, and my nuances are not the only ones; they just happen to be ones that really work well well for me. Um, and you may have some as well to uh, share back to me. And so my e email address run at ronlichty.com is up there in my picture window and it'll be at the end as well. So the five practices I wanna talk about are not just doing agile, but being agile. And this has been a discussion point for many of us for a while. And, and what I wanna do is share a couple of metaphors with you that have been helpful to me in convincing people that, um, that it's not just about practices. Uh, we wanna talk about definitions of done that generate predictable quality and nuances that allow that to happen, nuances to stand-ups that make them more than just status meetings, uh, planning meetings that result in plans that teams are willing to stand behind, and estimating that uh, delivers predictability. So those are my five topics. And so I wanna start with uh, one of my rules of thumb, one of the, the rule of thumb that has become my prime rule of thumb over the last few years, maybe the last decade, is that software development is a team sport. It is, it is not a sport of individuals who happen to be all be working together. It's really a team sport. And so I want to start by, uh, by talking about teams. And uh, we're going to, so this, this, so I'm, this is, uh, I, I'm planning not to be just a talking head. I want to engage all of you in this practice. And so we're going to, we're, we're going to have we're going to actually workshop a nuance at the end, toward the end. Uh, but talking about teams, I want to use something that is called a chat storm. So some of you may have done chat storms, but some of you may not have. And so what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a question, and I want you to type your answer into the chat, but do not press enter. So I'm going to give you about a minute. Uh, and then I'm going to have everyone press enter at the same time. And that's the, and then we get the chat storm. All of, all of your answers will come up at the same time. They'll come up in a, in a sort of random order. So the question is, think about the best team that you've ever been on. Think about the highest performance team you've ever been on. I'm gonna assume that that's probably the same team, but not necessarily, but think about the best or highest performance team you've ever been on and what were the characteristics or the relationships or the qualities or the ways of being that made that team stand out? So type that into the chat. Do not press return. Do not try pressing shift return to add things, but uh, put commas if you want to put more than more than uh, more than one word uh, or more, more than one answer. Put commas between them, and uh, and I, I will give you silence for thirty more seconds, and then uh, have you press return. Okay, press enter. All right, uh, uh, Volker, do you want to read just a just a, a sampling of those? <laughs> Fun, knowledgeable, passion for deliberate change, empathy, and more empathy. High personal standards, open communication, cross training, reliable, engaged, skilled, collaborative, camaraderie, people who listen to ideas without judging them, creating a culture of possibility and safety, honest discussion, closely situated, tight collaboration and problem solving, committed to a shared goal, management stayed out of the way, we're inspired, we argue passionately. Supportive, selfless, honest, thoughtful, respect. Um, people trusted each other and took feedback seriously. Um, 
a lot of respect, feeling listened to, feeling can there's bring a lot of, more of myself, belonging. There's a lot of trust, a lot of respect, a lot of feeling listened to. Um, so these are these are ones that come up really frequently. I I um, asked this question in in lots of lots of crowds, and trust and mutual respect almost always uh, come up. I'm not sure that, that they've ever not come up. Shared goals often come up. My teammates had my back is one way that people express the um, the camaraderie and the trust and the respect that they have for each other. And then the word psychological safety comes up uh, these days uh, uh, periodically. And these are these are uh, our characteristics of, of teams. Now I'm going to I'm going to switch gears for a minute and um, and talk about agile practices. And talk about doing agile because doing agile is, is about doing practices. And if we're doing if we're doing Scrum, and I'm going to mostly talk about Scrum. So you know when I when I think about teams and about these best things, and I started thinking about practices, and I thought, well, you know, maybe the real value. A couple of years ago, I thought maybe the real value is is in these characteristics like these, and not in the practices. And so I, I just made a, a really quick list of a few Scrum practices to th to say, well, is there value to these things? And uh, you know, this is far from the list of all the Scrum practices, but but I looked at this and said, wow, there's value in every one of these things. There's there's value. You know, you hear every once in a while you get on a on a on a um, on a, uh, a chat list and somebody says, you know, there's you know, don't don't bother doing any of the practices. Uh, you know, it's it's all about being agile because if you aren't if you aren't agile, you're not you're not going to get anything out of it. And I don't think that's true. I think you get something out of planning daily. I think you get something out of planning for every sprint and planning publicly and transparently and ordering work based on customer value and defining done and relatively sizing stories and de delivering frequently, and sharing how we're doing and reflecting on how to do better. I think we get something out of all of those things. I, so I think, there, I think there actually is, but I'm gonna segue again. <laughs> voting voting machines and voting uh, okay so here's the question do voting machines and voting make us a democracy no democracy comes from values and principles voting voting's a useful tool it's a useful practice for democracy voting machines are a useful tool for supporting a useful practice for but voting machines don't make us a democracy and voting doesn't make us a democracy. Democracy emanates from principles and values. And agile practices don't make us agile. Agile practices only deliver better teams. They don't make us great teams. It's agile values that inspire great teams. So this is, this is one metaphor that I've come up with that, that has been helpful to me in getting people to realize that this is really about values because here's the values out of the agile manifesto here's some of them build projects around motivated individuals trust to get the job done face-to-face -face conversation self-organizing teams the team reflects and tunes and adjusts those are those are all about values and principles and i want to talk about one of these so um let me see so looking at my notes here. So um, anyone who wants to type into the chat what a self-organized, a few, a few words on what a self-organizing team means would be really useful. So let's, let's do a chat storm for uh, 15 seconds. Just type in what a self-organizing team is. Hold hitting enter for the moment. Okay, hit enter. Uh, all are equal, all ideas matter, collaborative, instinctual, trusting. This 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 sounds like great teams. Some of those, some of those same, some of those same values and principles are each one shows accountability, no assignment needed. So I want to get into um I want to oh I did have this here. I want to get into uh uh the no, the notion that for a team to self organize that everybody has to participate and in fact that's what i've seen some of you come back with and i'm really interested uh afterwards to read all of what you've said 
uh, because I'm really I'm I'm really interested in uh, how self-organizing teams work. I think, uh, in my experience, that everyone has to participate. That every team mem member has to step up. That that basically everybody on our teams has unique expert expertise, and everyone on our teams needs to be a leader. Now, if everyone is a leader. Everybody is leading, uh, you know. So I'm not. I'm not saying that the product manager is going to code or that the um, the junior developer is going to be the architect, or that the architect is going to do product management and uh, and and write the stories. But I am saying that everyone leads from your expertise, from our expertise, and and that includes the intern. The intern on a team needs to be a leader. And if, in fact, we've got an intern who can't bring us something that we don't know, some way of doing it, some expertise from what they're learning in college right now, then probably we hired the wrong intern. Because we need everybody on our teams to be a leader and to, and to lead from their expertise when it's most needed. Now, I'm not also not suggesting that there are two leaders all at the same time or three or four or five. It's leadership that passes among the members of the team transparently. And so metaphors for everyone as a leader, I want to switch from talking about software to say, if our self-organizing team are an acting troop, what kind of acting do we do? Anybody want to unmute and tell me what kind of acting we're going to do? Comedy. <laughs> and the improvisation. Improv. Comedy is funny, but imp improv, improv is actually so some comedy is not improv, but all improv is is basically a self organizing team. There's a there's a rule of thumb for for improv. That's that is yes. And and it's and it's about always listening to the rest of the acting troupe always listening to where the acting troupe is taking it so that you can and so that you can add something to it and that and, and while you're adding you have to keep listening because somebody else is going to do that and so that leadership passes transparently among the members of an improv acting troupe so if our self-organizing team or a music group what kind of music do we perform jazz yes. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, so who's the leader? So everybody's a leader in a jazz group. Everybody's the leader in an improv, in, in an improv group. Everybody's a leader on a scrum team. Everybody's a leader on an agile team. That's the goal is, is that we listen to each other, identify when we can make a contribution, lead when we can make a contribution, keep listening and stopping when someone else takes the leadership. So we look at agile values and we look at best team characteristics, agile values of shared leadership and self-organizing teams, best team characteristics of trust and mutual respect and psychological safety. That's, that's um, maybe a Venn diagram of total overlapping, but it's gotta be close. They're indelibly linked. So there's, there, I got, when I started teams in agile 12 years ago, I got asked this question, are there projects not suitable for agile? And uh, you know, 12 years ago, Agile was uh, was had not hit critical had not hit critical mass yet. Uh, there was the big question of, well, does it apply to everything? Now we think it applies to everything. If we think it applies to business as well, not just to software. But at the time, not so much. And I scratched my head, and I you know I wrote embedded microcontroller software. I've got a couple of patents in hotel locking systems and smart card based postage meters. I thought maybe the software that's written for, for embedded microcontrollers, but I don't know. I think that would get real value out of doing it in an agile way. And, and so I was still scratching my head a couple of years later when I realized that the, it's the wrong question. The real question is, are there cultures not suitable for agile? Because this one I can answer easily. Micromanagement, cultures of micromanagement are anathema for agile. Micromanagement disrupts Agile, it prevents best teams, it prevents learning. You've probably seen what I have, which is that team members 
and micromanaged organizations will stick their hands in their pockets and say, okay, I did that. Tell me what to do next. They become order takers. Whereas what we want in Agile is for everyone on the team to step up, micromanagement causes everyone on the team to step back. And so what and so what's so what are we expecting out of managers? So I'm going to talk about managers for just a little bit. Uh, because traditionally, and and this bleeds through into agile, and, and it's a problem for us. Traditionally, managers run things. They give direction. They tell people what to do. They, they like being the center of, att uh, of attention. Here I am, a manager. Uh, I'm the center of attention. Um, and when we draw the, uh, the typical scrum team picture, we've got everybody in this picture except managers. And it's, it's, it, I think it's been one of the problems is that we've never really given managers a clue. That's why Mickey and I added a chapter to our, to our, to our book in the second edition on the role of managers in Agile because, because no one else is. No one's cluing managers in and how to be effective and how to effectively help Agile and their Agile teams be effective. And the, and the word we use in Agile is servant leaders. And we use it for scrum masters, we use it for product owners, we use it for product managers, and we use it for managers. This is a role actually that, that comes from um, uh, the X theory, Y theory stuff that was, that was posited back in the 1950s and 1960s. And, and it took Agile to catch us up 50 years later. Marilson Campos, who was a vice president of engineering uh, told me once, if you're the scrum master and everyone's looking at you, you're doing it wrong. And I think that applies as much to managers as it does to scrum masters. If you're the manager and everyone's looking at you, you're also doing it wrong. Because fundamentally software development is a team sport. Fundamentally software development is about teams. And so three of the, and so I'm gonna call out three things that I, that I, that I expect managers to do in organizations that I consult with. That are, that are agile, and I pretty much only consult with agile organizations these days, or, or organizations that say they are anyway. Um, and one of them is to foster or enable or support an agile culture, to model and defend and evangelize agile values, and to empower self-organization and excellence. Now, managers are gonna do more than just those three things, but these are fairly new things for managers and uh, as, as their organizations have gone agile. There's one more, which I, uh, I'm putting up separately because everybody everybody in this room, so everybody, everybody in this Zoom call, uh, in the Zoom room, uh, knows that the people who remove impediments are scrum masters. And we also all know that who scrum masters escalate to when they have to escalate are managers. And so managers fundamentally are collaborators in removing impediments, uh, if not, at the, if not at, the, uh, at the forefront. And then managers typically, teams typically want to delegate to their managers the continued role in counseling and coaching and man mentoring. They actually expect that of their managers. Um, managers are expected to figure out how to scale the organization, how, how as we get larger than a single team, how to, how to figure that out. And, uh, and, and then teams tend to, um, to delegate hiring and firing uh, or, or uh, recruiting talent and handling problem employees to their managers. And uh, teams do not like it when they've got problem employees in their midst, midst and they really do expect managers to handle them. And there's, and there's a lot of logistics involved in this, but I want to talk just, to, just uh, briefly uh, about these three things, the three very new things for managers, because managers have been removing impediments for a long time. And, and in fact, they've been fostering culture for a long time, if they're any good. And, and software development culture and agile culture, I believe, are pretty much um, uh, synonymous. So here's, um, this was, this was, this came from Agile Open uh, nine years ago. The statement that, and I wish I knew who said it because it, 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 was, it just so resonated with me at the time. Management sets the boundaries of what needs to be done and says to the team, I trust you to figure out how to get it done. 
And I think that really captures the, uh, what the uh, a core role of managers and the relationship of managers to culture and the relationship of managers to agile. And as I said, we we wrote a whole chapter on uh, on programming cultures, uh, which which I believe uh, is synonymous with agile culture. And one of those aspects of culture is communication. Communicate if software development is a team sport, team sports are gated by communication and collaboration. And that means that we have to create a culture of communication at every level with everyone up, down, within, and across. Now teams need to do this, but, but it's, it's a, it, it is a role of managers to foster and enable and uh, support and reward communication and collaboration. Uh, Kimberly Weefling, uh, and, and, I want to, and I want to say relative to managers communicating that Kimberly Weefling said, we have two ears and one mouth, use them in this ratio. Now, I, uh, before we put this into our book, and this is one of the rules of thumb in our book, uh, uh, it occurred to me, you know, was she the first person who said this? And so I did a, began doing a, a Google deep dive and discovered that there was someone who said it three, cent, uh, three centuries BC in Greek. So it, it, this, is, this has been a wise rule of thumb for a very long time. And if we have two ears and one mouth, if we listen more than we speak, and this applies to everyone on our teams, then I think we cannot over communicate. I think it's possible for people in sales to over communicate. I think it's possible for people in marketing to over communicate, but I do not think it's possible for people on product teams to over communicate provided they also work with the rule of thumb that we listen more than we speak. So then I wanna talk a little bit about uh, Google's Project Aristotle. And many of you at this point know about Google's Project Aristotle. You know that Google went off to figure out what characterized its highest performance teams and what differentiated its highest performance teams from other teams. And that it, it, and that it um, identified the word psychological safety. The word psychological safety has really come into commonplace use in software development and product development since that study. Uh, and so many of you already know that. Uh, if you don't know this, go, uh, go look up the uh, Project Aristotle and the New York Times story on it and the, uh, the write-ups of it because it's well worth doing. Um, psychological safety is the opportunity and the safety to speak up and, and, uh, and it's the mutual respect that encourages everyone to be a leader. There are, now we're coming back to everyone being a leader. There's one more thing that I think probably most of you did not catch. And I read through it several times before I realized it. Google said, we have a way that we can observe this. We can walk into a team and observe whether that team has psychological safety. And they came up with just a few words to describe that. Those words being equality in distribution of conversational turn-taking. When you watch a team that has psychological safety, when you watch one of their high performance teams, what they observed, what the Project Aristotle folks observed was that there was no one who was dominating the conversation and there was no one who was silent. Those teams had conversations in which everyone on the team talked about an equal amount of time. I think that's remarkable. And a remarkable way to take a look at our teams. Now, I want to say one, one thing about virtual teams and notice and note that there is no substitute for face-to-face -face meetings. So we're all remote these days, in my opinion where there is no way to get from remote what we get from being in the same place in, uh, in physical proximity with each other. This is not as fun as being, <clears throat> being uh, uh, where were we last, Volker? Uh, Capital One, I think. This is nowhere near as fun as being a Capital One and it's, and it's um, not nearly as nourishing either. There's no pizza. What can I say? But <laughs> There is never enough communication in virtual teams, and we really have to commit to communicate. 
uh, Ted Young, uh, who at the time was a guideware development manager, he's now teaching TDD, test-driven development, said the more distance between teammates, the more you have to formalize communication and make it explicit. So that's all I'm gonna say about doing, uh, about not just doing Agile, but being Agile. Now I wanna move into talking about definitions of done, the second practice. So definitions of done, I, um, Chris Sims taught me about definitions of done back then. I may have known about definitions of done before I took his first, uh, my first class, probably 15, 15 years ago. Um, I, I've worked with teams to create definitions of done. One of the characteristics is the team itself creates its definition of done. It's not handed to them. And, but it occurred to me a couple of years ago while I was working on the study of product team performance, is this really, is this really, does this correlate with performance? Does having a definition of done correlate with performance? And so in the 2016 study, so this is five years ago, we asked the question, what, 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 I, what I wanted to ask was, does having a definition of done matter? But then it occurred to me what I really wanted to know was who creates the definition of done and does who creates a definition of done matter? So I wanted to know the answer to both of these. And by asking who creates your definition of done, I was able to find out whether they had one in addition to who created it. And so we're gonna do a poll here. Volker, can you bring up the poll? To add? And so I, I want each of you to answer the question of who created your definition of done? So, you know, do you have a definition of done? Does your team, the team you're working with have a de definition of done? There, the answer at the bottom there is no one, we wing it. Uh, does the team itself do it? Does product management do it? Does engineering management do it? Does executive management hand it down? Where does it come from? Some people are still voting. <clears throat> We're about at fifty percent. Let's get a few more in. Not quite two thirds yet. We're getting it. We're getting to two thirds. Yeah. We're a minute into it. We hit seventy percent. Shall we call it good enough? Five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. All right, Bidding. let's end that poll. So, um, can you see the results? We no, we somehow we we were looking at the results, and there we go. So let's do that. And uh, Volker, can you take a screenshot of that for me? I should. So uh, I'm encouraged by the fact that two thirds of you, your team itself, is creating the definition of done. Uh, let me move on. So I'm going to stop sharing the poll. And we're going to move on. And here's the here are the results that we saw from uh, several thousand members of product teams all over the world. Only seven point four percent said no one. Did we have anyone say no one in our poll, Volker? One or two. One or two. Okay. So maybe that same percentage. Um, uh, we had uh, the product team itself at only thirty percent when uh, when it came back, but we had their product owner. Uh, having having done fifteen percent of them, and then product managers doing twenty, and management doing twenty three, and engineering management four point seven. What we found was that the seven point four percent of product teams that have no definition of done performed the worst. They correlated with the teams that said, "Yeah, we've got a terrible, we've got terrible performance, terrible productivity." The teams that just had a definition of done, having a definition of done did not move them into the high performance category. It was in fact, when the team itself or someone in the team itself, it's product owner. I think there was, I think there was confusion between acceptance criteria and definite definitions of done actually. 
uh, because I, I'm not sure how a product owner could create a definition of done for their team. Um, because definitions of done include engineering criteria and the, the team should be involved. Now, some of you may be in organizations that uh, the, the management says, you know, all of our teams are gonna have this definition of done. Now I've been in organizations like that and the typical thing that happens is they hand it to us and, and in, the, in the old days, they hand us a piece of paper that said all of that and we three hole punch it and put it in a three ring binder and put it up on a shelf and no one would ever see it again. What we want is a definition of done that everyone's bought, everyone on our team has bought into. And so I want to suggest to you that we do it like object-oriented programming, where we inherit, we inherit the definition of done from our larger organization. They, our larger organization has said these things seem to apply to everyone. Now, in fact, there may be some things that don't apply to us because we're often in doing data science or we're off in the back end or we're our teams is, is not working in the areas that everybody was thinking about when they created this thing. So there may be some things that don't apply, but there may be some things that apply specifically to us that we should add. It's like adding methods when we subclass a, 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 a core object. Uh, we're gonna subclass that, we're gonna add methods, we're gonna make it ours, and, and we're gonna put those things that are, are on our definition of done into our own words and make it our definition of done. And at that point, we've got real power because everybody has participated in creating that definition of done. We see what we see here is that team created definitions of done correlate with the highest performance teams. So bottom line here, definitions of done matter created within the team matters most. So I'm gonna move on to stand-ups. So we also studied stand-ups we asked the question, how effective and how frequent are standups in your organization? So this was in 2015. So we're gonna do a poll. So if you can do the second poll, Volker. How frequently does your team hold uh, standups? That seems an easier question. We're at 80%. Uh -huh. uh, you want to take a screenshot? You want to take a uh, screenshot of that for me, Walker? I'll show, uh, I'll share the results in a moment. We sort of are slowing down at 80%. So I'll end the poll and show you the results. Terrific. So 72% of you are holding daily standups. There are three times a week, twice a week, and not holding standups. Got a screenshot of that for me? I got it. Thank you. So uh, here are the results we got. We found that um, uh, effective standups were being held by almost everybody. Only uh, 18, 19 percent were was said that their 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 standups were either ineffective down at the bottom. They were either ineffective or they're they're so awful that they didn't even want to talk about them. So so a bunch of effective ones, but only 22 percent were holding them daily. 18 percent were holding them regularly, but not daily. So maybe twice or three or four times a week. Standups that were effective but not regular at the largest level at 40%. So again, this is back in 2015. So, so hopefully we've all matured a little bit more. What we found when we correlated then with the high performance teams, we found that product teams that do not hold standups or hold if ineffective standups perform worse. Not a surprise, probably not a surprise to me, probably not a surprise to most of you. Product teams with standups that are effective and regular perform better than average, and product teams with standups that are effective and daily perform best. So I want to talk. Uh, so standups matter. Standups held daily and effectively matter most. I want to talk a little bit about what makes for effective standups, uh, because I've been toying with this for the last couple of years, and. Um, 
And I had the benefit of, uh, of a learning from one of Chris Sims's counterparts at the time, Kathy Simpson. So let me start with this. What makes for effective standups? The three questions. So when I ask, so when I'm doing training, you know, this I get I get to stand-ups and I say, okay, so what what happens during what happens during stand-ups? And um, you know, 98% of the time people will say, well, the three questions. So okay, so then I ask, what are the three questions? And 98% of the time I get the answers. What's standing in my way? That's the third question. And that's fine. But the first two questions stated as what I did yesterday and what I'm going to do tomorrow. 90, not way, really close to 100% of the time, that's what I hear. And I think it's broken. Because who cares what you did yesterday or what you're going to do tomorrow? What we care about is what did you accomplish yesterday? on behalf of our team, on behalf of our customers, on behalf of whatever it is that we care about. And what are you gonna accomplish by tomorrow on behalf of our team, our customers who we care about? That subtle nuance, that one word change makes, uh, I've, I've seen, I, uh, I was working with a team in, uh, in Miami, Florida la um, last fall and they, Changed, they didn't change it to accomplish, they changed it to what value did I add? And what value am I going to add? And it made all the difference. It was just remarkable. And those three questions are, are useful. I've, I've got important here. I don't know whether they're important or not, but they are useful, but they're all me focused. They're all each individual about what did I accomplish? What am I going to accomplish? What's standing in my way? They tend to make them stand up status meetings. And so one of the things that I've seen over the last five years since we did the study is status is, is stand up meetings that have devolved into Slack status meetings, Slack stand ups. Uh, instead of a, bus, a bunch of individuals who report to the same standup, which is basically what they were before. Of course, they would devolve into Slack because all they are is status meetings if that's all that's happening. And, and uh, I credit my colleague, Ka uh, Kathy Simpson, for bringing, it, bringing something back from actually one of the Scrum conferences. The question, the focus, the realization, the focus is how are we doing on our sprint plan? How are we doing on our sprint goal? That's the focus of the standup. It's, it's, you know, the three questions are just a means of getting, getting it out and beginning to talk about this. And what she brought back was let's use a fist to five. Let's use a fist to five at the end of every standup to bring the focus back from me to us. To ask the question, are we on track to make our sprint plan? Now, all of you may not have used fist to five. So fist to five, if we're asking the question, are we on track to make our, our sprint plan, everybody's going to hold up some number of fingers. They're going to hold up five or four or, or a fist. A fist means I have no confidence that we're going to make our sprint plan. There's no way in hell we're going to make our sprint plan, in my opinion. Five means we are totally on track to make our sprint plan. We're going to make our sprint plan. We're, going to, we're, we're all going to be happy. Our, Customers and our stakeholders are going to be happy. Everybody's going to be thrilled because we're going to make our sprint plan. By pulling that together and then having a conversation, if we don't get fours and fives, we can find out that that uh, Bob or Sue or Sally or George is having a problem. They've walked into code and, and it's not their problem. Well, it is their problem. It becomes their problem, but, it, but it's not them. It's the code they walked into. They walked into code and discovered it's laced with technical debt, or they walked into the problem and realized that the, the, the algorithm they plan to use isn't going to work, or whatever it is, they need help. They need, us to they need somebody to have their back, somebody else on the team. And unless we're having that conversation about how do we make our sprint plan, no, one, no, no, no one's filling in and saying, oh, I can have your back. I can, I can, I can help you out here. Let's swap stories. I can do that one. I know that, I know that technical debt. I've, I've got another algorithm I worked with before. And all of those conversations can happen in that standup inside of 15 minutes, mostly. Or we may discover that everybody is taxed 
and we need to take something out of our sprint plan. And what's going to happen is that we're going to get to the end of the sprint and we're not going to finish everything. And instead of doing that, let's decide which thing we're not going to finish now. Let's let our product owner, who, whose job it is to understand customers and stakeholders and what's going to really thrill them and, what's, and what they're going to be least displeased by our removing, and let's figure that, let's, let's, let's get that out on the table and let's focus on the stuff that's really going to make a difference. And this lets us do that. So this simple fist to five practice can help a group of individuals become a team. So talking about planning, so sprint planning and sprint planning meetings, the first thing I want to say about them is that, uh, um, and I haven't seen this a lot in the last five years, but, but I, used to, I used to see it tons. You'd walk into a sprint planning meeting and the first thing that happens is the product owner say, oh yeah, we got to spend some time reordering the backlog. And the backlog's supposed to be reordered by the time the team walks into the room. That's a waste of the team's time. And, and part of the goal of Scrum, part of the goal of Agile is to stop wasting people's time. Secondly, the, team's gonna, the team should be pulling cards from the backlog into their sprint plan not somebody assigning work to other people. No scrum masters assigning work, no product owners assigning work, no, nobody else, no managers assigning work. This is not about assigning work, it's about people saying, I can take that one, I can take that one, I can take that one. And still we can lose sight of being a team as we break stories into tasks and identify that I, you know, I can take that one and I can take that one, but now we're back into that individual problem and again, I'm crediting Kathleen for this, for having brought it to me. Our goal is a perfect sprint plan for our team, optimum team effectiveness, optimum value delivery. The team tends to, to, to look at how, how do we be most efficient and most effective. The product owner tends to look at how do we deliver the maximum value. We're trying to balance those two things all the time, doing a fist to five confidence vote. Same deal. Is this our best sprint plan? Fist to five. Fist, nope, terrible sprint plan. Five, yep, this is the best sprint plan we can do. Three, well, what would make it the best sprint plan? Well, I think if we, I, you know, I think we got too many things in here, or I think if we swapped out this one for that one, or I think we're overtaxing Bob, or I think that the, the data, we've got too much data stuff in here, and we've only got one data person on our team. Uh, and, and, and that's crazy. And, and we begin to have those conversations around what makes us a best sprint plan and until we get fours and fives. So again, I'm looking for fours and fives and, and the conversations that get us to fours and fives. Not beating people up who have threes, but listening and learning from their insights into what's going to prevent us from having this be our best sprint plan. So finally, I want to talk about estimating. And, and, I, and I want to talk about some um, I want to talk about some principles behind estimating. So there's a bunch of people out there with the um, hashtag no estimates. Uh, that's a great. If your stakeholders, don't want to know when the stuff's going to be done and let you not do that. More power to you. I don't work with any, I don't think I've ever run across an organization that, that doesn't want to know when something's going to be done. And Agile, in fact, gives us some real tools for figuring that out. Uh, now, my next blog post is going to be don't let velocity, don't, don't let velocity leak outside your team. Velocity is not a measure of productivity. Uh, velocity is useful to the team as a metric, not useful to anyone else as a metric. Um, <clears throat> but the first thing, <clears throat> the first thing is that pointing is about relative, not absolute sizing. And the metaphor that I use for this, uh, so all of us, uh, all of us in the Bay Area, so I'm not in the Bay Area right now, I'm, I'm calling in from Seattle. Uh, I was traveling back and forth and decided this was where I was going to be locked down uh, a year and uh, a year minus 10 days ago. 
So I've been in Seattle for a year minus 10 days without traveling back and forth. Um, but all of us, uh, so I live in the Bay Area the other half of the time. And I, I, want, I want us to all, so, so um, Berkeley's got one thing that San Francisco doesn't have. Berkeley has a view of San Francisco. And so I want us to all teleport. <clears throat> I want us to all teleport up to the top of the Berkeley Hills. And I want us to look across at San Francisco and, uh, and, not, and, and many of us even who are living in San Francisco haven't been getting out as much as we want to. So you may not have been, have been uh, viewing the, uh, the skyscrapers that have been going up and I, don't, and I don't know how much building has been going on, but let's stand up on the Berkeley Hills and we'll look at the two tallest buildings in San Francisco. And, uh, and I'm sure we can, we can look across and point to them. And I'm gonna ask you, how tall are those two buildings? That's absolute sizing. How, how tall are those two buildings? How many feet tall? And you're gonna, and, and if you're like me, this is like a, a Google interview question. How many, how many tennis balls do you get inside of a 747, right? I mean, it's, it's like one of those questions. You're gonna, you're, so how are you gonna solve it? Well, you, you count windows, that's probably, uh, unless it's a data center and it doesn't have windows, in which case you're really in trouble. But if, if it's got windows, you can probably count the number of windows now you've got to figure out how many feet there are per story and you've got to impute, you know, and it's like, yeah. And there's this problem that they didn't build the two tallest buildings on the Berkeley side of San Francisco. They built them in the middle of San Francisco and, they're, and the bottoms of those buildings are blocked by buildings in between the buildings and the Berkeley Hills. So you've got to count the windows on those buildings and then you've got, and maybe a couple of layers of those and you've got to impute in the, the number of feet per story is not the same in the older buildings than the new building. And so you're gonna you're gonna spend a bunch of time getting absolute sizing. But if instead, if instead I asked you a relative sizing question, if I instead I asked you which tall which of those two buildings is taller, you would immediately tell me an answer. And if I said how much taller, almost all of you would come back and I said, but what percentage taller is it? You're almost all 5% taller or 10% taller. You're willing, you're, you're not going for feet. You're not going for absolute size. You're not, you're not rattling on, on exact, on exactness. You're saying, well, it's about 5% taller or 10% taller or with the um, Salesforce tower, maybe 20% tower, uh, taller. I don't know. That's a, it's one heck of a tall building. Now, if I now give you whatever that percentage is, if I now give you the height of one of those two buildings, you will, within a minute, all of you will give me back the height of the other building. It's the percentage times the, the height of one building is the, is the height of the other building. That's what we do with velocity. If we, if we relatively size all of our stories in a backlog together at the same time, now we can walk down our back and now, now when that backlog is put together in, in some kind of order that we're going to do it, we can, we can actually walk down the backlog with our velocity and say, May 15th, this is probably where we're going to be. And we'll be right, plus or minus 20%. My experience is in a, in a quarter out, three to four months out, we can be within 20% plus or minus on, on where that's going to be, provided nobody puts more stories in there. So that's always, always always a clever thing that happens in startups with with CEOs who ideate at the rate of uh, at the rate of speed uh, rate of speed of light. So pointing is for entire backlogs, not sprints. So I walk into organizations all the time that that uh, will we'll point that will point the stories in the next sprint. Well, what good does that do? That doesn't give you any forecasting for 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 your stakeholders to say when are we going to be done. We need, to, we need to point into our backlogs. And the thing that holds us back on pointing into our backlogs is the technique we use. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back around to the, the technique I learned from Chris Sims a long time ago and from Steve Bachman, who he learned it from. But first I wanna talk about, uh, we actually studied this. We, I was really curious about how deep backlogs are and how deep teams estimate their backlogs. And so we asked the question, do individual contributors size all the stories or requirements in the backlog or just those that have been selected for the next iteration? And as you can guess, we're gonna have a poll. 
So the poll, same question, do individual contributors size all the stories or requirements in the backlog or just those that have been selected for the next iteration? And you've got a choice to say, oh, we only have that many in our backlog. Or to say of sizing, what sizing? We're uh, uh, hashtag no estimates or something, I don't know. But <laughs> I think you're missing the option of a few sprints. Uh, which one are we missing, Michael? Uh, the option of, you know, maybe not just the uh, size of the next duration, but maybe the size of the next three or four. Yeah, so uh, uh, go for uh, only an iteration or two. So uh, if you've got three, if you've got three, it's still in that it's still in that order of magnitude. I missed the or two, so that I, I get it now. We're at seventy five percent. And voting, yeah, eighty percent. Okay. Voting, voting's mostly completed, though. I think. All right. I will share the results. So that's really cool. Forty two percent are are sizing their entire backlog. Uh, Twenty one percent uh, have have a backlog that's that's a quarter or more. Um, uh, whereas 30% are facing a really short backlog to be able to work with. Um, and, I, and I find this too often that, that uh, they've got just-in-time backlogs, which is not terribly helpful. All right. Uh, did you grab a screenshot of that for me? I did that. Super. Super. So sizing Sizing the entire backlog. So this is what we found in 2019. So this is what we found last year. It was it was uh, at the very end of last year. So more or less that. Uh, and we found that. Um, well, let me let me walk through this. Only 17% of organizations have a quarter or more backlog and and uh, size the whole thing. And that's what we found. Whoops. That's what we found correlates to the high performance teams or teams that have a full backlog and have estimated their whole backlog. So I'm going to go on to uh, pointing this for entire backlogs, not sprints. It's done by the entire team. Now, why? And so I'm going to have you open your mics. Why do we want the whole team to estimate? Not the tech leads, not the managers, not the product donor, the whole team. Why do we want the whole team estimating? Well, for me, it's about level setting. So everyone develops the same understanding of what the size means. Good. Who else? Uh, by, by their contribution, uh, they make commitment to do it as uh, regarding the estimation that they have done. Yeah, people are bought in. Why else? Everyone has different skills. Everyone has different skills. Boy, that not that true? Uh, why else? Estimation uh, usually in, invokes conversation. That's the most important part of it. Another thing that if uh, you make an estimation, it is something that you are committed to. If somebody else made an estimation to you for you, you don't uh, give reds behind. I'll, I'll buy both of those. Anyone else want to chip in? Yeah, you gain an uh, insight and perspective that you might not have heard otherwise. So uh, say more. Which perspective is that? Uh, from each of the team members contributing, if, if only one person speaks, mm -hmm. um, you only gain one perspective. If everybody speaks, you, get, you gain multiple um, views on the same topic. Yeah, it's really rich, isn't it? Yep. Anyone else want to contribute? Okay, so there's 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 a ton of good reasons why we want, we want the whole team to be to be pointing, and then 
um, and and, um, and so the technique that I've that I've used the entire time I've done estimating in agile teams takes less than half a day. And it's not planning poker. Because uh, uh, all of you probably probably many of you've done planning poker, there's a set of planning poker cards on the right. There are three drawbacks in my mind to planning poker, maybe four. The, the, for the first, for the, uh, you know, if you're starting with a new project and you've got all of these stories in the new project and you, uh, you pick one, where do you start? That first story, is it a five, is it an eight, is it a 13, is it a three? How do you, how do you, if they're all relative to each other, how do you know where to start? There's no such thing as a three or a five or an eight or a 13. It's all made up and, and, and it's all about relative. And, um, and, I, and I think it's really, I think that's really hard. Secondly, it can succumb to guessing. So those of you who remember Johnny Carson, <laughs> this is a while ago, uh, Johnny Carson used to have a character called the Great Karnak and he would hold an envelope up to his head and guess what was inside the envelope. And it feels like that with teams sometimes, doesn't it? Where, where oh, I think this is an eight. It's like, what's an eight? No such thing as an eight. Ah, the story's like that story and that story was an eight. Oh, that's helpful. That's useful. That's a relative. That's relative sizing, and th and third, it takes a long time. And uh, and doing planning poker with uh, an entire backlog, uh, an entire backlog of project stories can can uh, I um, no one I've met has has been able to say that they've been able to do that with planning poker. So the other technique, and the technique I learned from Chris Sims and that, that Steve Bachman, um, uh, the Steve Bachman method, Steve Bachman pioneered 18 years ago, I think, um, is, is way faster. Uh, and, it and, it, and it engages the whole team. And it guarantees that stories are sized relative to each other. It's two pass relative sizing or snaking uh, in the full in. That's what it looks like. Uh, uh, with a team that I was working with that had 150 epics. Now imagine planning poker with 150 epics and stories. Think about how, how long 150 planning poker uh, uh, rounds. Uh, actually, it's, it's way more than 150 because you do multiple rounds with uh, if you don't if you aren't in an initial agreement. Here we start with 150 cards. This is so. This is physical. I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you virtual in a minute. This is physical. We start with 150 cards, and, and some of you have done this technique, uh, and so I'm going to get into some nuances of it. Um, the uh, here we start with 150 cards. We put the first card, uh, the first person, first team member puts a, uh, 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 the first card on the table and and uh, hands the deck to the next person. The next person reads that card, says, "I think this is going to take less time or more time," and puts it on the table. Hands the deck to the third person. The third person. Is, yeah, I think this one's going to take less time or more time than both of those, or it's going to take some, some time that's in between the two. And, and um, uh, two hours later, you've got a snake of 100. It turns out 120 because we discovered that 30 of the cards that were in that deck were duplicates or were already done. So we got <laughs> we had 30 cards out of our JIRA. So the JIRA printed these out. So we had 30, 30 cards out of our JIRA system that were cruft uh, uh, just alone two hours to create the snake and then another hour we started the upper left hand uh, uh, end of the snake is uh, is the, the, the card that will take the least amount of time we started there with ones uh, put ones on until somebody said now these are these have got to be twos and, and then somewhere somebody said now these have got to be threes and fives and eights and thirteens and twenties and forties and hundreds. So it took us took us three hours. I've never I've once had it take five hours. I've never other than that more than four. So this is a half day technique that um, that actually is a is a really good chartering exercise because it gets everybody into the project and understanding not just the mission of the project but the but here's here's what we're actually thinking of building. Yeah, so a couple couple of questions, everyone. Yeah, yeah. For, um, okay, so I'd like. I liked what you said about chartering. When you say chartering, you're bringing in some of your stakeholders, right? Uh, so we may have stakeholders in the room to ask questions of, yes. And we'll have the product owner and the architect, the corporate architect, if we need them, in the room to ask questions of as well. 
Okay, sweet. I like that. And um, but these are stories in name only, so they haven't really dug down into what they need to do, and there's no definition done associated with them at that point. Yeah. So these are stories in the classic uh, Mike Cohen version of stories, uh, and they and and in fact, the very first time I did this twelve years ago, these were just feature names, because I was uh, because back twelve years ago I was transforming uh, I was transforming waterfall teams to agile. In the, last oh, okay. few years, in the last few years, I've most, mostly been transforming Agile teams to Agile. But 12 years ago, I was transforming waterfall teams to Agile, and all they had were features. And so we, and so we did it with features, and it, and, and it worked just as well with features. Okay. okay. And, 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 and we're not rattling into the details. We're just understanding enough to say this is going to be bigger or smaller than, the, than these that are already on the table. All right, that's great. And then you're just using uh, Fibonacci, or are you using ours? I see ours at the bottom. Fibonacci. Okay, wow. great. Yes. That's brilliant. Thanks, Will. And, and and we're using modified Fibonacci, so it's the one, so the one that's you know, that's uh, uh, thirteen goes not to twenty one, but to twenty forty and hundred. Mm. So we're typically using modified Fibonacci, and 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 I think one of the good reasons for using modified Fibonacci is. This is the I of ROI. This is how long it takes. That's the I of ROI or the uh, uh, the buck of bang for the buck. And it's a lot easier to divide by 20, 40, and 100 than it is 21, 34, 50, whatever it is. <laughs> it's, that's a hard division. And okay. at this point, we really don't know enough. And 20, 40, and 100 is enough to, to be able to handle this. Nice. Now, and and just to add ahead. one more. One more <clears throat> subtlety mm -hmm. to it. Um, when you pass the stack of cards, you have a choice between placing a new card or disagreeing with the card that is on the table and so, move something that someone else placed. So in Steve Bachman's method, that's totally true. I've removed it from this. And what you and 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 added the I want to put this card here. Does anybody disagree with that? So there's a little bit of looking around the room for agreement that goes on while we're putting them in the room. Now, the very first time I did this, I worried about uh, you know planning poker has planning poker. I I love the fact that with planning poker that it really engages everybody. Everybody's got to hold up a number. You are you do not get out of uh, participating, and uh, and I worried about this. Do we get everybody participating? And in fact, in that team twelve years ago, that very first team I was working with. So uh, you know, I'm going to segue for a minute. So so many, uh, probably most of you have done Myers Briggs. Probably most of you know what your Myers Briggs is. Mine is ENTJ. I'm just barely on the on the E side of IE, and almost all of you know that the I side stands for introverted. What you may or may not know is that something like 76% of programmers are INTJs. And that means something like 80 to 90% of them are introverts. And I had, in that team 12 years ago, I had somebody who put the capital I on introvert. And you're looking at this room, this is not the room, it, it, this looked about like their snake because we had 120 stories in their snake as well. But she was sitting, it was a bigger room, and she was sitting in the corner, way off in the corner of the room while the rest of the team was gathered around the table. And I thought, this is not going to work. I, you know, I learned this from Chris. You know, I've learned it from Steve Bachman. I, I, um, you know, this is not going to work. She said, and then we're on about the fifth or sixth card, and I suddenly, I look over to the corner of the room, and she's not there. And I looked around, and, I, <laughs> and she was standing at the table, and she had a death grip. On, on the card that her colleague was about to put down because it was her code. And she was not gonna let him put it down where he was gonna put it down. And I thought, whoa, <laughs> this, is, this, is got, this technique's got some real power to it. So if you find that, that people don't engage, then, um, then you can go back to planning poker because it does guarantee that. Uh, but, but my experience has been, I have not yet run across a team that does not engage everyone on the team. In, in that uh, you, you aren't putting it down where you're putting it down because it's my code kind of way. Uh, so I, I, it's been very powerful. Now Volker, your, uh, that, is Steve, that is the way Steve describes it. He's got a 99 cent uh, ebook. And 
And I also use this technique for valuing. So when we're valuing projects against each other inside of a larger company, or when we're, when we're trying to figure out what thing we should work on first, what's the highest value stories, I find that if we've got multiple product owners in the room, they are really attached to, uh, to stories or to projects. They've got pet projects up the, up the Yazoo and uh, and the, and Steve's technique absolutely. I I haven't found I haven't found a way to shorten the technique from Steve's from 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 Steve's original technique on that one, which is uh, you have a choice when you've got the deck in your hand of either putting down a new card or moving a card already in the table to a different place. And your colleague may have may have put your pet project down really low in the value stream. And you think it's really valuable and you move it from the bottom to the top and it goes back and forth multiple times until, until the players wear out actually. So I wanna move on. There, uh, what we've been talking about is two passes and, the, and one, of the, one of the things that's magic about this is there are no numbers in the first pass. This is created without numbers. There are no Fibonacci numbers here. There's nothing to tie it to anything. And with the result that what you're getting is just a snake. And, and when you then go through the second time around, so this is again, this is Volker, this is again a, 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 a segue off of the way Steve did it because he put them in categories. But the, but the snaking allows you to not deal with numbers until you've got them in the snake order. And then you're walking through with ones and twos and threes and fives and figuring out where just, you're just figuring out where the breaks are. And it means that you're not getting into those number fights that first pass around. So you're sizing by the modified Fibonacci numbers. Now, so this is in a physical room. Here's what it looks like in Miro. So this was the this was a, the first time I did this technique with a virtual team. My client was in my the headquarters were in rural Maine. It turns out there are not a lot of .NET programmers in rural Maine, so they were scattered all over the place. And and we needed to do it. We needed to distribute it tool and this team was already using real time board which has now been renamed to Miro. And so we used Miro and so this is their this is this is their snake and and, and it's more ladders than it is a snake because they go left to right across the top row. Those are ones and, and maybe twos and twos continue on the second row and, and it just can, it continues down in in rows. Here's another team that's uh, that's done the very same thing. They've got different categories of things. So they've got technical debt and, uh, and user stories and bugs mixed in to their, uh, to their sizing effort. Uh, same deal here with the colors, uh, with a team that was using Mural uh, and using Mural's cards. Uh, and instead of stickies, this team was using uh, Miro and its cards. And, uh, and, and in both this case and this case, we had Miro and Miro tied into the Jira system so that if we made a change on the card, it, it in the uh, Jira system. So both of these both of these systems are tied into the um, uh, to our, uh, I have APIs into, into Jira and maybe other tools too, I don't know. Um, so it should take less than half a day. So pointing contributes two useful outcomes. Product owners can own back, backlogs by bang for the buck. So, so um, I don't know about your product owners, but uh, I've been a product I've been a product manager. I've not been a product owner, but I've been a product manager, and I've got an idea of how long things are going to take. And I'm right some of the time. As a manager, I've got an idea of how long things are going to take. I'm right some of the time. I'm also wrong some of the time. And what the team is doing is giving the product owner the input so that they can figure out, so that they can not put teleportation at the top of the backlog for one thing. Teleportation is my favorite story. And teleportation, every time I give it to developers, they tell me it's going to take an infinite amount of time. It goes from the top of the backlog to the bottom of the backlog because we order the backlog based on ROI, not on value. We order the backlog based on bang for the buck, not on value. And with velocity, teams can provide predictable forecasting. And with velocity, by having relatively sized an entire backlog, we can once that backlog is recreated, we can we can uh, we can work it. 
So I'm looking at the time, and we are not we are we are, we are not going to go use a mural board and do it and and do an example of this. Um, the exercise I was going to do was what's the uh, overhead of eating fruit? The cost being the the R of the R of eating fruit. The return on investment is the flavor, the one you might choose flavorfully, but the I being the cost. How much time does it take to prepare a serving and to clean up after eating it? And uh, we've got 12 of them and we were gonna go off into breakout rooms and, and do this thing and, uh, and we're running out of time. So we're not gonna do that. But the, um, and let me skip beyond teaching you Miro and, uh, and there was the board we were gonna use and the 12 fruit. And here are two typical answers that come back and, uh, and I want to I want to use this to illustrate that. Notice where mango is on the top one and where mango is on the bottom one. And these are two different teams. And one team thinks it's thinks it's an eight. They think it's harder than oranges, tangerines, and lychees. And the other team thinks it's way easier than lychees and watermelons and pineapples. Uh, whereas the first team thinks it's the same as as pineapples and watermelons and both of them are right. They are right for the team that did it. We and it and uh, and it's one of my one of the arguments that I use to convince teams not to share velocity outside of their teams because velocity is applicable to and relative sizing is applicable to specific teams. I've done this exercise uh, uh, a ton of times, and uh, and I once had a guy who had uh, a tool for every one of these fruit. This is a this is a guy I want on my team. I want on my fruit eating team, because he is going to prepare. He's going to prepare that tree. Now cleaning up afterwards is another matter. And uh, for those of you who don't know about durians, they stink to high heaven. Uh, there are rules on subways and in, in, in hotels in Southeast Asia that say if you bring a durian, durian into this hotel, you will never stay at this hotel again because they stink to high heaven and, uh, and they're a delicacy. So the, the eating value for those people who like them and, and who ignore the smell or, or uh, have decided that that smells like the taste uh, is very high. The, uh, the eye of getting your whole team down uh, upwind by two miles before you cut into a durian is very high. So um, durian, durian generally goes there. Um, so the product owner reorders stories by ROI as a backlog. Um, they're they're going to take what came, comes out of that snake. They're going to reorder it based on ROI. The backlog is not what you're creating in the snake. The snake is just input. So that the product order, so that the product owner can order the backlog by bang for the buck, because you've given them the buck. And to one of the things Sasha said earlier, it's the conversation. Whether it's snaking or poker, it delivers shared project understanding. It delivers shared product understanding. It delivers shared understanding of the stuff we're going to build. We have conversations about it. It surfaces experience and expertise. It engages the entire team, and it is an, an awesome chartering exercise. You get uh, one of the chartering exercises is to get the product owner up to talk about the mission and and what it is we're going to do for our customers and how they're going to be better by it all. And another piece is and what are the pieces and how do we understand them? It's what our product managers always wanted when they created 400 pages of requirements and handed them to us and said, here, understand these tomorrow, except we can do it in four hours and we don't have to read 400 pages. This is Steve's book, it's 99 cents on Amazon. I also want to note that he wrote a novel about software development that's a beach read and it's fun called Predictability. That's well worth uh, your I have seven bucks or eight bucks or something on Amazon. Steve Bachman. Um, I often, uh, so I often, so often teams will say, could you work with our executives? And I'll do an executive training and I will have them do that, uh, that snaking exercise with the fruit. But before that, I'll have them do a waterfall, work task breakdown. 
I'll start with, oh yeah, we wanna eat some pineapple. So let's do a work task breakdown. And I give them eight minutes to figure out all of the, all of the tasks that it takes to, to prepare a pineapple for eating and to clean up afterwards. And it will take them eight minutes. It, it, uh, it actually will take them, it would take them longer if I didn't give them eight minutes actually. But I give them eight minutes and they, they generally get it done within eight minutes. Uh, let's see, I don't think I have an example, but they, um, but though, but if I give it give it to two different groups of people, I'm likely one of them is going to come back and say there's eight minutes worth of time here. Another is going to come back and say there's 24 minutes of time here. It, it it's uh, it it is as reliable as waterfall estimating is, and then we go into the uh, the snaking. So what's it? Um, yeah. Oh, so there uh, actually there's an example. There we go. There's an example of, uh, you know, we, so this team started by Googling cutting pineapple <laughs> and, and washing it. This team did not have the guy with the tool for it on their team. Uh, and they came up with 16.4 minutes for the uh, for preparation and cleaning of their pineapple, which is probably, which is reasonable. So bottom line, relative sizing is impre it's imprecise but it's adequate for two things. One is for the product owner's input of I of ROI and with velocity, our ability to give a forecast to our organization that builds stakeholder confidence in us. And, there, uh, and the beneficial side effects are chartering, delivering shared project understanding and surfacing expertise and experience and engaging the team in its work. So takeaways, how do we foster being agile? Don't just do agile. Foster shared leadership and agile culture, trust our people, shield teams from politics and distraction, remove impediments, empower self-organization and excellence, create a culture of communication, model, defend, and evangelize agile values. Secondly, stand-ups matter. Stand-ups held daily and effectively matter most. And we talked about effectively as bringing the team together as a team, not a bunch of individuals. Definitions of done matter created with the team within the team matters most. The fist of five technique helps teams be more effective, both in their standups and in their planning. And effective pointing leads to effective estimating and allows us to relatively size an entire three month plus backlog. So there's my book. So to do a screenshot of this if you want it, because it's not gonna stay on for very long because it's got a, um, there's a, um, um, code, discount code to uh, get 35% off at informit.com. And here's how you can reach me. Questions? Other comments? I love the, I love the questions we were having around the uh, snaking. Hey, Ron, um, is that game on the web, the, uh, the, the fruit game? I don't know, actually. I don't know whether it is or not. I think that would be fun to have. Is yeah. that something you can share? Are you comfortable with doing that or not? Um, I don't have the time to. <laughs> we are recording this, <clears throat> and it will be up on YouTube. Okay, so. great. Thank you, Volker. Oh, so the, the recording, yes, the recording's fine. Great. Hey, Ron, when you're doing the estimating, what if you have uh, the team um, saying, hey, we don't have enough information for this story right now? What, what, what do you say to them? So I, I, um, I go back to the, uh, we're not trying to figure out how many, how, how tall this, the, the skyscraper is. We're trying to figure out whether it's taller or shorter than the other one. And, uh, and, 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 and if we don't have the product owner in the room, then, then that might be a problem. <clears throat> but generally, uh, what we're really looking for is what's the stuff? The, the, the thing is that, that when we're looking at skyscrapers, we immediately know which one's taller and we also immediately know what percentage taller it is. We can look at it and see that. And developers can look at two different stories and say, this one's gonna take me longer. 
uh, and 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 two different developers and two different testers, in fact, and 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 it's why we we have to evaluate on multiple criteria. That's why I threw both preparation and cleanup into the fruit sizing exercise, is because that's two different uh, two different vectors to think about. We need to think about developing, and we need to think about maybe developing front end, and developing back end, and, and developing some database and doing some testing. We've got four different vectors at least in most stories, but but as a group, we can figure out, is this one gonna take longer than that one? Is this gonna take less time than that one? And um, it, it's really not that. I mean, I have, I've, I've been in, in situations where teams could not come to a relatively close agreement. And then that was an indication for a spike or some prototype or just sort of set it aside, parking lot it, and um, clearly for more exploration. You know, and uh, to Volker's point, what, what I often do is say, so what, what's the longest it's gonna take? Where it's let's, let's okay, so we're looking at a range here. It could take this amount of time, it could take this amount of time. I think we're probably looking at an epic. And, and it's just is it a 20 or 40 or 100? And I've, and I've had teams, and Volker, you may have too, I've had teams that get into arguments over whether it's a 20 or a 40. At the point at which it's an epic, we don't care. It's really, you know, is it a small epic, a medium epic, or a big epic? That's all we care about at that point. Because they've got to be broken down. We can't. We can't build it. We can't build epics. We've got to break those down into stories. But it's really helpful to know that they're epics. And it's really helpful to know that they're really big epics versus medium or smaller epics. Thank you. Uh, how do you handle unknowns in the sizing? Something like. Well, if there is, if that has a method for this, then it will be real short. But if there's not a method for that, then it will take us a long time. Yeah, uh, yes. And, um, and developers, uh, developers can generally say, yeah, that'll take a long time relative to this other one that's gonna take a long time. It's probably gonna take more or less. Remember, it's not about how long it's going to take. It's just about where does it go in the snake. We have another question in the chat, and that speaks a little bit to sort of how much flux and change is happening in the backlog, um, and therefore how often do you need to go to redo this exercise to accommodate changes, new stories, um, <clears throat> new requests. Great, great question. Uh, so how, so it, it depends, what it depends on for me, what I, what I encourage teams to do, I, I want, uh, so one, I want to hold back, I want to hold projects backlog. The, the, the notion that product owners can't come up with stories for an, the, the entire backlog, all that means is we didn't, we didn't give them a week to think about it before we started working. This is, this is like developers sitting down and starting to code without planning. It's, it's, it's bad, this is bad juju. Don't do that. So we, we, need a, we need a backlog of stories and, and the stories are just, you know, as, a, as some kind of user, I wanna do something in order to accomplish that. What we're trying to accomplish is really important piece of stories. And I, and I, really, like to, I really like to see those. Although, as I said, I've done this with just features. So, so that's, that's the starting point. Now we've given that snake to our product owner. They've created a backlog, the top of the backlog so, so those stories can be spread out and we may never get to the details of the stuff at the bottom of the backlog. So I don't know about you, but um, my teams mostly don't finish everything that they, uh, that product owners think they're going to do in some amount of time. Uh, but we do want to finish the stuff that's at the top of the backlog because that's going to give the most value to our, to our users, our stakeholders, our customers, whoever those people are. And what I'm looking, what I'm looking for is two and a half sprints worth of stories at the top of the at the top of the backlog that that have a lot of detail, that have a lot of information, that have a lot of understanding. Because when we walk into planning a sprint, 
we need, we've got a time box and we need to fit them into the time box and we need understanding between product owner and uh, uh, developers and testers of what it's going to take to build and what, what this thing actually is. Now we need, now we need that description and we need two and a half sprints worth because we may have to pick and choose because everything at the top of the backlog might be front end and we only have one front end developer and and so we need a mix of front end and back end heavy stuff or database heavy stuff whatever that is or not or not um, so big that it's going to swamp QA at the end of the, it there's a bunch of mixing and matching we've got to do and so two and a half sprints worth is, is good what happens uh, and so in startups CEOs tend to ideate at a rate that exceeds the ability of developers to develop. And they're constantly throwing um, ideas onto the idea train. And the idea train keeps leaving the station. And, and when our product owner says, you know, that idea belongs in the top two and a half sprints worth of stories and it hasn't been sized, then two days and and uh, we're not going to break the sprint so we're not going to we're not going to throw something into the middle of a sprint we're not going to change our sprint plan it's an option for the following sprint so two days before the follow beginning of this following sprint we're going to tack a 10 minute meeting onto the end of our stand up the team stand up that 10 minute meeting we lay out the cards or we bring up the miro board that we did last time we bring up the new stories uh, either on cards or uh, on, on mural board cards and the team in uh in 10 minutes maybe 15 fits the all the cards that have come up in the since we did it the last time into the snake i had a team once that the product owner um, the product owner, the product owner, newly arrived uh, startup. Uh, the CEO, the board was pressing the CEO for for what are you going to get done in the coming quarter, and the product owner um, was beside herself. We had a very, we had a, the the engineering and QA team was was highly agile, but they had never they had never sized a backlog. They they were all, they were sizing on a sprint by sprint basis, and she had no information. On, she had no nothing she could use to forecast what they were going to get done in, in a quarter. And I said, boy, if I got a deal for you. Uh, and we did the snaking with all of the project's stories, probably two quarters worth of stories. We snaked all those and then, and then she identified what her value streams were or what her feature streams were, call them that. Um, and and she, she was going to get this much of that feature and this much of that feature and this much of that feature and this much of that feature. And um, and uh, and we figured out what the team had done in the previous quarter, and that gave us the, the number of points they had done in the previous quarter by taking the previous stuff and fitting it into the snake, and that gave us the the size box that she could fit this thing into. And then she walked it into the CEO's office, who who said, "Well, now I need more of this one." And she said, "Well, you got to have less of something else." And and so they did that horse trading. But they ended up where and box the box didn't get any bigger as a result of being in the CEO's office. It wasn't doesn't magically grow. There's no twinkling of the nose that that magically grows the box. Um, and and uh, and she came out with that and she held off the CEO to say uh, uh, every time he came up with a new idea, she said, "Well, do you want to take something out of the box?" And he kept saying no. And so nothing pushed its way into for an entire quarter, and and uh, and and we hit that plus or minus twenty percent on that quarter. The team did uh, of her forecast. It was it was really close. Uh, and then we got to the end of the quarter, and and we she had only planned one quarter, so we went back then with all of those new stories and put them into the snake. So it could be as long as a quarter. More typically, it's it's. Um, uh, one, two, three, four sprints. Every 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 several sprints, you're gonna you're going to be laying the cards back out and fitting new stories in because they're pushing their way into the top two and a half sprints worth of work. All right, I'm watching time, so maybe one last question before we wrap up. Terminology. Uh, Can I ask, ask about terminology? I noticed you're saying one project a lot of times. Um, are, are these really projects or are they products? Are we focusing? Yeah, I, 
I, I, I tend to I tend to interchange them. I tend to interchange them because I've been around for so long. Okay. Um, the, uh, I, I'm to I'm I'm totally um, the the whole project to product movement is is awesome. <laughs> it's, uh, it's so so wonderful for teams. It's so wonderful for companies. It's so wonderful for stakeholders. It's so wonderful for customers. Great, um, thank you. Uh, yeah, and so I'm I'm using them interchangeably. I've really, I, um, yeah. Uh, Ron, I was uh, uh, trying to use the same uh, approach for estimating uh, value, uh, relative estimation of the uh, uh, epic values so that we could calculate ROI. Okay. And uh, what worked pretty well for estimating efforts when you are playing the same game with a bunch of executives uh, where politics is involved, we ended up with clinch when uh, every person was trying to say, no, my, uh, my uh, pet project has more value. Or wow. no, my pet project has more value. And we have a, a, a clinch could not make, uh, at some point we uh, ended up in endless loop. Any suggestions how to break out of that? Yeah, it, it's the it's the one that Volker called out is it, it's it use use true so I've just shown you modified Bachman use true Bachman true Bachman is what is what Volker described when he said you get the you get the deck of cards and you can either put a card on the table or you can move a card that's already on the table and right. uh, and, and 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 there and and there's no agreement you just get to do it. And the next person may move it to back to the where it was. That's exactly and, what happens. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. And what happens is they they wear out. <laughs> Just let it happen. They'll wear out. They'll get tired of doing that. They'll have conversations with each other about it, and they'll say, "Well, okay, so would you stop moving it if I moved it to here?" And, <laughs> and eventually, and, and eventually, they wear out. So I, I can only tell you the experience. I, I, I also have done that. I, I found I had to use Steve's technique, not, not my modification that I use for sizing. Um, but, but it's worked out every time I've done it. And, and I, I, boy, there's, I a useful, really there's a useful request to just set aside the contentious value conversation and ask every party to actually contribute information based on what estimates are you, like what is your expectation of how fabulously rich the company is gonna get if we launch this product? And what's your evidence for, that, for, that es for those estimates? And once you, you ask for more information, things get more realistic. Yeah, that's, that's thank you, Walker, that's really helpful. Thank you. It goes, it goes back to what you were saying, Sasha, about the value of the conversation. All right. Thank you so much, Ron. That thank was, you. Uh, thank you, Volker. Thank you all for, for uh, putting up with me for uh, uh, talking, talking more than I thought I was going to and not being able to get to uh, our going off to a mural board. And I'm, I'm kind of tickled by how valuable it is to just remind ourselves of those nuances and the details that uh, really support <laughs> what we're doing or what we're trying to get teams to uh, accomplish with each other. Um, so yeah, I, I gave this to a group of CTOs, Volker, and one of them came up to me afterward and said, thank you for reminding me of that. And it, and, it, and it is sort of like that, that um, you know, some of these are new nuances. Some of them are nuances that, um, that we know, but we've let slide or, or we've forgotten about, or the last team didn't need them, or for whatever reason, it's uh, good to be drawn back to them. 